couple of words about the house. Uh, uh, this is an original house of uh, Mutsok. Uh, actually, it was born. Uh, it, it was uh, built even before the time of Mutsok Clementi. It's elder than uh, uh, Mutsok Clementi wasn't the first owner of it, uh, and. Uh, it was his uh, London house, so Muzio Clementi, who is an Italian composer, uh, he used to live uh, more or less uh, his whole life in London. In uh, this uh, or big part of it, in this particular house, and uh, he was not just a composer, he was also an owner of a little uh, company which was producing proto pianos. Uh, it was not quite a piano and it was not quite a clavi clavichord or clavichord? Hepsichord. Uh, it was something in between. It was his own invention and it was a step on the way to, to the proper piano. It was kind of proto piano and you have in this house, uh, so this is a normal one, but you also have this proto piano here outside. You cannot play on it uh, because it, it sounds like hell, but you can, you can look at it. Uh, there was uh, also a London house of Mendelssohn Bartholdi because uh, uh, the children of Clementi who owned uh, the house, uh, and I think the grandchildren, uh, they uh, were in close relationship with Mendelssohn Bartholdi, so he spent a lot of time here. And uh, uh, they, uh, the legend is that uh, uh, very many important and interesting people visited uh, this house, probably indeed. Uh, and now it is owned by Tom Stacy, I think. Some of you uh, have seen Tom. Uh, Tom Stacy is a writer, a journalist, uh, um, who worked for uh, different uh, important English newspapers uh, for many years. And he visited uh, all kinds of interesting places in the world. And he even uh, uh, wrote once an interview with Khrushchev. So he has a certain connection to Russia. And this house has a negative connection to Russia. Uh, it's, it's, uh, as you see, it's, it's a bit higher than the whole street. It's because people from this street sold their stones for, to build St. Petersburg. Uh, and, and this particular house didn't sell the, st his, the stones from their garden to build St. Petersburg. That's why they have garden which is a bit higher than the rest of the street. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, what what is also very interesting, uh, uh, the wife of the owner of the house, uh, he is sculptor and uh, artist, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. She's uh, 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 very ill now, unfortunately, but they have a private exhibition of her. We cannot uh, uh, come there as a whole group, but if somebody or some of you are interested, I probably could take you uh, upstairs to see uh, her, scu her sculptures. They are unbelievably good. Uh, Katya took some pictures, and uh, and this is a connection to our uh, to, to our today's speaker because Katya Margolis, she comes from Venice, and uh, she is an artist. She is a writer. She is as mighty with words as she is with pictures. Uh, here we have uh, uh, some of the pictures. Uh, they are also for sale. Uh, um, uh, you can buy them as uh, Christmas presents, and uh, we uh, actually uh, uh, we uh, invited uh, Katya uh, um, uh, partly because uh, it was a presentation of uh, a book of Oliar of this book. Uh, of, uh, it's a book of Vikram set. Uh, it's it's an interesting story uh, because Vikram wrote his book in California while being a student uh, for economic uh, in California, for PhD uh, for economic in California. And he occasionally came in the bookshop and read a translation of Eugene Onegin. And, uh, uh, he's not a Russian speaker, he's a Indian. No, he's, he's Indian. Indian. Origin and has yeah. nothing to do with Russia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No so, word, no word, but uh, he uh, read this translation of Eugene Onegin of Johnson, who is also a, a former British diplomat, and uh, uh, he fell in love with the uh, rhythm, with music of uh, Eugene Onegin, and he wrote a book uh, which is called Golden Gates, uh, 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 which is written in Onegin uh, uh, verse. 
uh, and it has the same amount of capitals, uh, uh, chapters like, like uh, Eugene Onegin, and there are certain parallels or certain ideas. It's also uh, un unrequited love and... and yeah, but uh, it's quite a different plot. It's yeah, yeah, really but it's of course a different plot because it's about uh, uh, American youth and about their problems. And uh, then it, it went the whole way uh, through and back because it was translated in 30 uh, or more than 30 languages. And after 30 years, or after 32 years, it was tra finally translated in Russian. And it was again translated in Onegin's verse. So it's second Eugene Onegin about Californian youth. Uh, and uh, they published this book. It's, uh, uh, Andrea Liar was translator of this book. It, it, it's also a friend and, and protege of Valentina Pradukhina, who is now with us. Uh, yeah, and her publisher. Uh, so we have all kinds of connections and uh, he was uh, presenting this book together with Katya who is an illustrator of this book. Uh, so we have Venice here, we have India, we have uh, California. California, we have Pushkin, we have everything. <laughs> and as a matter of fact it was a very funny evening because everybody represented everybody. We at first agreed with uh, Vikram Seth that he is going to come and present his book himself. But then he finally went to India and started writing a second uh, book and verses, uh, which will be called, uh, he's uh, author on, of a bestseller, uh, which is uh, called Suitable Boy. And now he's writing Suitable Girl, again an Onegin <laughs> verse. So the book uh, Suitable Girl is, used, uh, is going to come in Onegin verse. It will be his second Onegin uh, book. And uh, interestingly, instead Tatiana, of coming to, to his... Tatiana, not any. Ah, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, Tatiana's book. And, 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 and instead of, uh, of coming here, he kept sending me new chapters of Suitable Girl. <laughs> uh, and then finally, uh, he sent an acrostic uh, with uh, an invitation and, and uh, with, uh, 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 some greetings for the public. Uh, who was coming to his lecture, but he was, uh, 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 who stand in for him was a former British diplomat, here we have a connection, uh, uh, Michael Fripster, and here we have connection to Johnson again, uh, uh, he, he's his friend of youth, and uh, it was an evening, uh, a, a very interesting evening with uh, this uh, Michael Shipster, Katza and Oliar, it was a couple of uh, days, uh, ago, so people who missed it uh, envy us because it was really uh, very, very interesting. But now we have, we decided, uh, as as, uh, uh, as we have had Katya with us, we decided to do her own evening with quite a different subject, with uh, with a thing which we all love, with Venice. Uh, and uh, uh, as it was uh, this high water in Venice this year, as always, but this year high water was higher than normally, uh, and uh, so we decided to take it as a subject, but not, of course, not high water as such, but high water in, in its association, uh, in, 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 in ideas, in literature, in uh, art, even in music. And uh, without further ado, uh, ado I, I give the floor to, to Katya. But the first one I thought it was a very British attitude to make the most of it. So we had this terrible aquatic high water with 164 centimeters. Of course, it's not 164 centimeters as such, but the measurements are taken from a certain level at the Punta de la Salute, it's a point in Venice, where the measurements are taken. And it's the tide, or how tight the water, how high the tide is, the level, the normal level of the sea, which is zero. So it's 164 from normal uh, level of the sea, and it was about, let's say, this like in my city. <laughs> so uh, we decided as we're in such a nice environment, in such a nice city room, as I feel like at home, that we would be a similar dog to that, and I think like all those people I could have at home, and we're kind of very cozy, friend-like atmosphere, so we decided not to make it of uh, academic talk and projection, and, uh, but anyway, I would like to share with you some of the pictures and some of the visual thing as well. Uh, so, uh, 
I would as a quite a uh, quite a normal phenomenon in Venice. It's just the tide. But this one was a quite exceptional. And nothing similar has happened in 40 years. And I'm 45, and I've been living in Venice for 14 years, so I've never seen anything like that, although 10 years ago it was almost that bad. So that, I was, uh, that inspired me for a small piece of work, which is called Up Wild, <laughs> and I'll show it like that to you. It's a boot, it's a boot that we use walking when we walk anywhere to school or to work or whatever when it's up quieter and when we uh, wake up in the morning we get a text messages saying the the forecast for the up quieter is such and such and i get emails every day actually but this day was an exceptional day so um anyway uh, we uh it started like normal and i'm just explain you just a few more mythological, not quite cultural facts about Aqualta. They may seem very technical to you, but you'll see later that I have very much to do something uh, with uh, the national mentality and the, uh, the whole vision of Aqualta Venice within the Italian, Russian and a little bit maybe English culture that I didn't have much time to go into, but still I will mention that. So uh, this is a St. Mark Square. Everyone knows it's an, it's an iconic it's picture. Right. It's, it's, uh, it's switched. It's switched. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, it's not iconic. It's my home. It's not as iconic as St. Mark, but still. Uh, yeah. So uh, what we see here is a no, is a tide. What we, what Italians and people that have to do with sea and living next to the seashore, called tide, and in Italian say, se ora, se ora cresce, se ora cala. Any people who have to do with sea know they're tide, six hours, rising six hours, falling down. It's a normal daily routine, like a sun, sunset and getting a sunrise. Uh, there's nothing particularly dramatic about that. What is more right that there are some factors that contribute to uh, the water getting higher than the normal level, which are, which are first of all the so-called Shiroko wind. Shiroko wind is a south wind is, uh, coming from northern Africa that pushes the water uh, through the, the two kind of gates, the Lido shore, that Punta Sevioni, that divide the lagoon from the Adriatic Sea. And there's all kind of small doors, so if you squeeze a lot of people, or you have a big concert, a big show, at some point people won't fit. And the same happens with, oh, you fit it so much that they, they may crowd. So at this point the aqua alto rises. And here's just for you to have an idea what it looks like. Most of you see. Uh, this uh -huh. is my street, that's my window, that's my daughter going to school in the morning. Uh-huh. Through the water? Yeah. They kind of all speak or they're going through the water or by the water or walking on the water of Cominare Sulacqua, the Hardinia Pavodum. It's a uh, evangelical, biblical. Is metaphor. she in Wellingtons? Yeah, she's in the normal boots. She boots. We got the text messages. We know it's pretty high. Uh, she still has to go to school. That's how it should. Uh, early in the morning, we are woken up by sirens, by alarms, and we know. And I'll talk about that slightly later. Uh, that's and this at a certain height of the water, when the uh, waters are put into the lagoon, so the water the water level rises, and there are different kind. I'll show you of uh, codice codes, color codes, and also sonar codes that would tell us how high the water would be. Uh, because it's a kind of normal normal forecast that any people, any person in the universe should know has to do with our everyday life. Another thing that's very important to understand that for Venetians, and I'll talk about this, but it's not a calamity, it's not something, it's unpleasant as in a snowfall or maybe a thunderstorm, but it's something 
that happens quite regularly. Maybe worse, maybe better, but not tragic, not dramatic. Sometimes it gets quite bad, like the water goes in the house. You can see my cat watching our entrance and sitting room. This is or the garden or the sitting room when it gets bad. We have an hour and a couple of hours to get prepared for that. It's not, it doesn't happen every year. But we're like farmers, we're quite apt and prepared, so we take everything up and the water stays here, then the water goes. Yeah. So no, no carpet. Uh -huh. This is my daughter looking at the text messages, trying to find out whether she what what she should wear, wear for school. Yeah, that's me taking the morning coffee <laughs> in the bar. You can see that a lot of people in the bar. Everyone is taking coffee. Uh, nothing particularly tragic is happening. <laughs> well, 10 years ago it was quite bad and some children were actually evacuated from school. We uh -huh. have some parents bringing children since we live nearby, uh -huh. nearby to school. <laughs> so some parents are bringing children from the school to our house. But anyway, yeah. So this is, uh, and this is Shiroko. So the normal, the normal way, there is Comune di Venezia, so the side, the website of the Comune, of the uh, Venetian, uh, every day shows, as I put it in, it's for today, so the forecast for today looks like that. So That's what? The heights, of the, the heights of the water, the astronomical tide and the actual tide. That's for today, that's what's happening now. So uh, we're about so 18, so it's, it's, it's evening, it's minimum, it's 10 now. So well, there are a few codes, color codes, that uh, one should know. The normal tide is from minus 50 to plus 80 centimeters uh, above the level of the sea. It is green which is more than 80 to 110 is yellow. So what happens with yellow, the San Marco Square goes underwater. Basically every time we get any, the San Marco Square is one of the lowest parts of the city, so it gets water anyway all the time. So I can see excited tourists every day saying, oh, how lucky you are, there's a flood in Venice, how beautiful, <laughs> tick, 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 tick. Uh, but actually, any time it's slightly, because uh, San Marco Square is about six, 64 or 70 centimeters. And so there's nothing. What is about this uh, Codice Arancio, that's 110 to 140. And then there is 140, what is called Mare Eccezionale, exceptional tide. Uh, what else we should say that the uh, term itself, aqua alta, high water, is not a general Italian term, it's a particular Venetian term. Uh, it's spread into normal Italian, as you know, Italian language is still quite divided uh, in dialects and local kind of languages. All the contribution of Dante, of course, is very important, but we still speak very local languages. And what is high time? Alt is high. Alt is high, it's normal Italian, but the whole term aqua alta is Venetian. Mm -hmm. The proper literary and scientific term would be alta marea, high tide. Mm -hmm. High tide. So it uh, uh, de dramatizes again the whole thing. Mm -hmm. There have been. Mm, very briefly, I say, they, of course, this phenomenon has been present in Venice throughout the whole history, throughout Venetian history. So we've got accounts of the 8th century, 11th century, 12th century, 15th century, 16th, to now on. 
we've got uh, as we've got English people and the classical, which is also quite interested uh, because uh, a small comment to uh, Venice, as you know, is the port of intersection of many cultures has always been of Oriental, Western culture, European and uh, Oriental, it still is, there are a lot of layers, there is an English Venice, French Venice, Russian Venice, German Venice, Venetian Venice, Italian Venice, whatever, what? so when you live there for some time, you notice that people, you just, it comes into very funny anecdotal kind of things, uh, like people walking and stop, English people would stop at the Pansione Caltini, which is the Zatre, the uh, fundamental Zatre, uh, and they would stay there looking at the, this here John Ruskin stayed in 18, he published the uh, Stones of Venice 1851, so 18, let's say 49, and was preparing some of his drawings and text for the Stones of Venice, which is for any British person is the Venetian book. <laughs> As for Russians, they don't care about Ruskin at all. You, you can see Russians just running by passing this Pansione Calcina, not caring about Ruskin whatsoever, running a few meters, uh, crossing the bridge, and there's the lapid at the plaque. Joseph Brodsky wrote his famous Fundamenta da Curabile watermark here in that place to uh, to promote the glory okay. oh, sorry the glory uh, of Venice and so Russians stay there while French people turn left <laughs> to the small colony and they find a palace that no Russian and English would particularly care for unless specially told they would stop at part so Contarini Polignac the same belongs to an old uh, neo uh, Gothic, very old, one of the oldest palaces, facades of the Grand Canal, which now be uh, belongs to an uh, aristocratic French family that it has very close connections with Marcel Proust. So, for French people, it is the the palace. Mar Mar Proust stayed there many times. Marcel Proust stayed there many times. He described it, and moreover, the recent filming that, I don't know if anyone of you know, been uh, discovered, there's a short film, actually, more, where you can see Marcel Proust walking down the stairs, it's been found last year or a couple of years ago, in the, in the, in the upper <coughs> store somewhere in that palace, where there was some filming, the beginning of the theater of the, some nephews or nieces, a wedding, some family archive, then all of a sudden somebody noticed this guy looks like Marcel Proust coming down the stairs, and it was, in fact, it was him. So, uh, uh, so therefore, uh, there, is a, there are a lot of different Venices, and therefore a lot of different perceptions of the Venices, they point of attraction for everyone, for, uh, and of course they can speak about Turkish Venice, and Oriental Venice, and Japanese Venice, and uh, it's a topic in itself. So what, what for instance, John Ruskin writes about the high water, uh, let you remember for further reference, he said, the average rise and fall of the tide is about three feet, varying considerably with the seasons. But this fall on the flat shore uh, is enough to cause continual movement on the water, uh, in the waters and the main canals to produce a reflux that frequently runs like a mill stream. At high water, no land is visible for many miles to the north or south of Venice. And it's again a very interesting view because as you can imagine, Ruskin ties, we didn't have any drones or planes, but Ruskin has this kind of cosmic overview uh, you notice it many times, you notice it with great artists, with great painters, that they have a higher vision, the idea of high, but of higher vision, is from up somewhere like he's seeing in the mountain on the plain, or uh, the same, for instance, is true for the f first plan, for the first printed plan of Jacopo Barbari, that was printed uh, in the Sixteenth beginning sixteenth century in Venice. This is so accurate. It's a woodcut print. It's so accurate. I can still find my own house there. It's like a Google map. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> and it's the copy of that print almost any Venetian house would say that's the first kind of uh, air portrait of Venice hmm. uh, so at home what it is so he says there is no water he likes flies above Venice and describes how high water is perceived I want really the whole portrait you can find it it, it's well the chapter six the paragraph six of the stones of Venice and he's also have some notebooks where he mentioned this high water phenomenon but he's mostly interested not in how it looks within the city but how the whole lagoon looks like basically the land disappears and uh, there are a lot of historical maximums registered for instance the first what did we have it's 589 non imperia neque in sumus viventus we're not living not in the land not in the water uh, or I can cite anyone uh, like uh, 1535 there was so much water in 1535 that the world, the wells were destroyed. And mm -hmm. it should be said that no water, aqua dolce, as opposed to aqua salata, mm -hmm. is we know, because the hot water brings the sea water, so it's salted water, it's not drinkable water, it's not mm. aqua potabile. A while before the actual the canals, you know, we had mm, normal tap running water, the Venetian campo, which is called small squares, were built, if you make a cross-section of a Venetian campo, it's kind of triangle, there's a pot, a well, and the filtration system of uh, sand, mm. and four or three or six, depending on, the, uh, on how the square is planned architecturally, uh, holes where the rainwater drains through, and then cut up to, uh, through the filter of sand, and that's how water, the uh, drinkable water, um, was uh, was delivered mostly in the in the town. Mm. They closed all the. We still have the wells. Uh, they closed all the wells uh, in the 19th century. They started to close it before, but this was the one of the source of the um, plague of the any epidemic thing because it was. So, but anyway, we can. Uh, so there haven't been much registration, but of course the phenomenon itself, uh, they started to register the height. We have some, like, El Mare Sirzo, 1550, El Mare Sirzo, Altissima Altezza, a very high height. So we don't know exactly how high it was. Mille Seicento, 16th, 17th century, 1600. Le acque salirono di sei piedi, so the water grew six feet, so now more or less it's more or less like, like we had a month ago, I suppose. Uh, and then uh, 1831, acqua fisso nei primi gradini del, della porta del, del seminario alle zattere, that's a more precise thing, uh, that's we know where the seminario is, so we, the stairs are still there. Uh, in when Napoleon, that is still, uh, who is still very much hated in Venice, mm. like a normal Venetian, he brought a lot of rational and useful things to the uh, city. We can't deny that, but he's done his rationalization in such an imposing way that still Venetians, most Venetians that are talking about Napoleon, is as passionate as we're talking about, I don't know, Theresa May, Trump, or Putin. <laughs> the self seen people just not talking to each other because of Napoleon. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, but the, again, uh, the same thing, because the perception of time in Venice, and I would uh, mention the plate, is quite different. It's a, on one hand, it's a small provincial town that feels itself, herself, if we talk Italian, as a center of the universe anyway. So we are the island, we are the empire, we are the city. So century plus minus is just minutes ago and minutes ahead. The world will pass and it will stay. The same, uh, the same applies to important cultural figures like when Russians come there with a nice white open and say, oh, 
Joseph Brodsky lives here and wrote his famous novel, his famous essay, Watermark. Uh, Venetian well, normally they do appreciate Brodsky's writing very much, as they do Shakespeare, The Merchant of Venice, as they do Byron, as they do Goethe, whoever, whatever, James or whoever, Master Proust, whoever wrote about Venice. said, yes, Brodsky also wrote about us. <laughs> <laughs> and that's more or less uh, the uh, the perception. Uh, anyway, it was uh, so Napoleon introduced the exact measurements, and I won't go into detail now. Who is interested can tell more about that. How these registration of the high water. So we basically uh, have the first registration in the time of Napoleon. He even said Magistrato delle Acque, which was a specially appointed office. And in 1867, we got the first notice, Aqua arrivò a 1553 centimetri, 153 centimeters. So that's 10 centimeters less than five months ago. That's exactly what we had when I showed you the pictures of my daughters going through the water. That's, that's quite high. That's extraordinary. That's codice rosso, that the red alarm that we get. Uh, and from there on, all the registrations, so there are some reading forecasts how often will we get uh, that bad water. Another interesting thing that and we are now coming closer to our main topic uh, of the cultural perception of the Aqua Alta was a very witty and very clever. Uh, they thought of not by an art historian, but uh, just uh, I think he was a student at the time, studying meteorology or some technical discipline related to environment or something. He, as we all know, Canaletto, the famous painter of the 18th century, yeah? Yeah, we, of course we all know these iconic uh, landscapes by Canaletto. Uh, it is well known that he, as many many artists of his time and even before that, as Vermeer, as Caravaggio, he used camera obscura to make his first drafts and oh. his drawings. As we know, the camera obscura is the process <coughs> of the photo camera with the lights coming, the, we got the, through the lens, the reverse image uh, in the mirror, and then with a paper, half transparent paper, and then you can draw the outline of the landscape that uh, Canaletto and a lot of these drawings, a lot of them uh, are like say in the Museo Carrer in the Venetian archives, but he was also a good friend of the um, British ambassador, so a lot of these drawings are actually in London, can be seen. <laughs> but anyway, this is not related to exactly to the but these drawings are very precise, they are almost like photographs. So what this guy did, he analyzed these black, uh, when the ties go down and up, you can see the weeds mm. staying the foundation of the building of the palazzo and of the bricolet of the, how do you call them in English, I don't remember. The, mm. So he analyzed the season, various seasons, as there are a lot of drawings by Canaletto, he analyzed these highs and these drawings to see how the aqua, how the high water and the tide was moving during uh, Canaletto's lifetime. And he used this, his painting, as evidence of the high water of the 18th, uh, 18th century. Uh, I won't stop much. Uh, Unlike high water, there have been an event in the recent Italian history, on the 4th of November of the 1966, and it was not exactly an aquat, it was a disastrous thing, there was a calamity and the people died. Another important thing to say that no people is on every community, every website, every book you'll find. High water is a normal phenomenon, uh, it's not a calamity, it's not a nightmare, it's not something terrible and catastrophic. It is a normal thing. People don't die in high water unless they're drunk and sick. <laughs> in the uh, unlike that, the 4th of November of the 66, 
and I can pause the book and there have been uh, was a very dramatic uh, event in the Venetian and Italian Cintanaio di Morti yes, hundreds of people died <coughs> in Venice because there was an extraordinary coincidence of uh, various events of the poor and adige, two rivers being full and at the same time there was uh, Florence been flooded, a lot of archives and artwork perished in Florence. The same is true for Venice. If the photographic archive Alinari, the beginning of the century, perished in the Fondazione Cini, some of the paintings were damaged, uh, the ancient Armenian manuscript, the uh, Lazaro, the Armenian island, and also some manuscripts in uh, San Marco and Doge's Palace. For it. It's quite Extraordinary to look at this, at this, and it was really wow. the end. It oh, was nice. very catastrophic. Oh, and unlike normal tide, oh, yeah. and it's shaped not only, and I would translate, it's shaped not only the the uh, the the uh, vision of the high tide and the perception of the high tide in Venice itself. It was a, and you can see there are some. The, also, the dam was uh, was broken. The half of the island of the Pilastrini, which is the continuation of the Lido island, has been demolished. People, I still have uh, accounts of my friends who told me their father was leaving the first floor, the Russian, the English, uh, Russian first floor with a boat. I mean, there was no light, no electricity. The water did, had come down for 22 hours, which is absolutely extraordinary. Three hours normally, five at the worst. Uh, there have been no, no food, and they would be just, everyone would take their own private boats and go save people around. Mm. Uh, it was a state of emergency, mm -hmm. but I should say the state of emergency had been declared a month ago in Venice as well, as it was when it's growing over 160. We've got, for instance, on the ground floor, we've got electric plugs about this height, but still, for instance, I lost my fridge and my oven, although it was on the air quite high, uh, because it was not. But this, um, this event, and there's a very beautiful thing, if somebody is interested in recent Italian history of generation of Italian, it's called La Menu Juventù, and it's talking about, it's kind of series, TV series, 20 years ago, I mean, it should have better the youth. And it's talking about the generation of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. It's a family story, but very much reflecting the whole Italian story. And of course, the flood, the idea of the flooding, that everyone is perishing, and all of a sudden, Italian culture and Italian perception, as I said, especially Venetian, is very conservative. So even some people here, I've spoken to some people who live there and remember their fathers going in the darkness with their boat looking for food or to helping out people and just knock at the window and say, darling, I'm back, <laughs> can I have something to eat? Because my friend and the candles and I mean, a few days like that. Uh, that shaped also the whole place. So also the 68, the famous 68 in Venice, in Italy, is partially, not to a big extent, which had been 68 everywhere, mm -hmm. the left wing, the protest, the kind of new world coming, the... Look, I asked specifically this question to people who said, yes, we had this memory of something catastrophic. It was almost like the old flood, the mm -hmm. biblical mm -hmm. flood to mm -hmm. them, that changed the perception of the time. I just, there's, uh, recently there have been a big celebra kind of celebration, of celebration, memorization of the... And it is called the Aqua Grande, mm -hmm. unlike Aqua Alta. Aqua Alta is high water, Aqua Grande is great water. It is the term of the 4th of November of the 66th that every Venetian people, every Venetian person is remembering in it. And to commemorate, to commemorate this event, a lot of hotels and libraries and universities and public places put a string, a tape Mm -hmm. in the height where the water reached <coughs> that day mm -hmm. in the boat, 4th of November 1966, 4th of November 
2016. Mm -hmm. So it is, and also an opera that even have time. So they were written specifically to that occasion, presented on that day in the La Fenice Theatre, mm -hmm. uh, called Apo Grande. There's a special publication by Gazzettino, as you know, the word Gazzetta, mm -hmm. Gazzettino, or was his Russian Gazzetta, the newspaper is a Venetian origin. Mm -hmm. Gazzettino. And uh, just like a bus, you can look through it too, mm -hmm. while we talking. You see there, people mm -hmm. coming with the, mm -hmm. with the umbrellas and through the streets of Venice. Mm -hmm. So now we are uh, coming back, and uh, uh, therefore there is something so much catastrophic and apocalyptic, eschatological, some about this event. Uh, that people start to um, look differently at the whole phenomenon for a while, while it was just rain or just normal kind of cyclic event of high tide and low tide. Uh, what happened that um, people start to talk about high water in different in different key. And uh, so now we, let us remember, if all of you know that, of course, but I'll just pull very quickly the basic symbolic thing that we, about waters, floods, Bible, Gospel, or our culture that we all know. So this is the famous Tintoret painting, mm. the creation of the animals. Uh, it's in the Academia, so it's 16th century, mid 16th mm -hmm. century. Now we've got who happens in Venice, we've got a big, couple of big exhibitions yeah. within 500 years. Uh, Tintoretto. Tintoretto was born. Wait a second. Yeah. Uh, anyways, this is uh, in the academy. I like most works by Venetian artists and Tintoretto that were, as we say now, site-specific. This work is now taken to the academy gallery. There's, and there's this big water fish that's a detail. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, we have the, in the Genesis, the, uh, the water is the first substance. So there's this presence that the Spirit of God is flying over. Then there is the flood event in the... I can pass them. Uh, Noah, Noah in the Ark. In the ark and... Uh, Again, we have uh, we have reflection of that in the uh, mosaics of San Marco. Mm. So when the earth was flooded, you know, it was saved. Yeah. And that's a mosaic in one of the cupolas of San Marco, oh. in the 13th century. Uh -huh. Looks very modern. Uh -huh. Very modern. Very modern. Very minimalistic. <laughs> And that's the universal high water acquired. The what year is that? Sorry? It's the 13th century. 13th. Wow. So we'll uh, remember the legend. Uh, there are a few other events as we remember in the Old Testament when the Moses brings the people from Egypt and the waters get past. And we all know that in the Old Testament, waters are mainly symbol of the danger and of the death. And we've got <coughs> in some Psalms, we've got, I remember it, uh, <coughs> in English, mm -hmm. and I cite it. Save me, save, it's, I think it's a song in Russian 68, in English and Italian Russian 69. Save me, O oh God, for the waters have come up to my neck. Uh -huh. I sink in the mirror depth when there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters, the floods engulfed me, I'm grown out calling for help, my throat is parched. Спаси меня, Божий, вы воду дошли до души моей. Ага, объяли меня воду до души моей, да? And that's the symbol of dead, danger, etc. Uh, and, now to a brighter note, to those days, very telling story. So, they finally decided to build a dam there, which called Mose, the project Mose. The dam that will close at a certain level of water, 
and won't let the aquarium uh, in the in the town. There have been a lot of, as always in Italy, a lot of fuss and discussions and demonstrations pro and contra, and uh, people are saying that will uh, disbalance the ecological balance of the lagoon and this and that. So that was more or less the idea, that the symbol, and this that was supposed to be called Mose, Moses. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, yes, that was first. It was so divided. Yeah, divided and two opening. Yeah, first it was due in uh, 2010. Then it was due in 2013. And then it was due uh, on the 2018. What what happened actually? There's been a lot of corruption. They they built a lot of it. And I've seen it, and they're still building it. There's been a lot of corruption. The mayor, the mayor of the previous mayor of Venice, had to resign. I've been arrested under corruption, and he was in the also university profession. I won't tell you because that will tell uh, bring us a long way away from our main topic. But basically, most of the money has been stolen, and or. Uh, unrelated people and recruited to do that, so this thing doesn't work. There have mm. been millions and billions of uh, um, euros, probably it doesn't work. It still doesn't work. We may have, I remember we were giving some interview with the high water ten years ago, saying yes, I hope Mose will work soon. He said, well, we hope, yeah, it was kind of pro Mose, mm. kind of TV program, it was 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, what about the, as for the New Testament, the waters are, again, present in our European Christian culture, but it has more to do with baptism, with purity, and the purity, of course, it has a direct reference to Judaism and washing from purity, and Ligua, and many, uh, many other things I would, I wouldn't stop at that now. Mm, and another important important uh, image is walk, walking by the waters when Christ walks by the water, which is uh, a symbol of something miraculous, but actually as regards the Old Testament, it's the symbol of resurrection, if we take waters as the symbol of death and danger, Christ walks over it, so it overcomes death. Uh, surprisingly, surprisingly, and I will I think I have an explanation, a kind of explanation, that there's been no Venetian, whatever, how rich of different subjects and motives and legends of all kind of, and especially biblical and particular for gospel references, there in Venetian painting and art, there's almost nothing about walking the water or anything that refers directly to, uh, to our subject. There is, a, mm, there is a painting, the most enigmatic painting, an allegoric painting of, uh, of um, by Bellini uh, that's, uh, that conserves some water. And um, it's not, I think it's not in the National Gallery, but anyway, there is a brilliant mm -hmm. exhibition that you have now in London, uh, Bellini and Mantegna. That, <laughs> I'd recommend to everyone. It's absolutely beautiful made. And there's some <coughs> water, and there's lithium water, lithium. And there's a, uh, the inter later interpretation is that it's the uh, Paradiso Terrestre, the paradise, the paradise, and the uh, waters of oblivion that separate others that we need to forget in order to get to another. Mm -hmm. Another another life. Also, there is uh, quite any uh, as for Florentine. Uh, again, there is a quite an interesting uh, tractor that I couldn't find. I found it quite a, unfortunately. I couldn't find the English text, so I have it in Italian and in Russian. Mm, there is a Dante that text attributed to Dante mm, mm -hmm. that. Talks. It's a kind of scholastic tractate, but it's called about the uh, water and the earth. And where he's discussing at very long and for here terms, uh, 
It's called the question of the land and earth, dubia. Mm -hmm. What is higher is the nature of things, water or earth? So he analyzes it in terms of for importance of the material, like what is high. So the higher should be closer to heaven. He analyzes it geometrically, making circular lines, seeing what is high and what is... And he slightly mentions the water going high and the tides, and the tide is very much, which I got to mention, uh, related to the phases of the moon. It's a psychic thing. It is a cycle. It is a cycle. And it's quite a curious uh, the, um, thing to look at. And he, with various arguments, and then he annihilates his own arguments and says, well, maybe it's just the opposite. Uh, so the, it's very medieval in, its, uh, in itself, the whole scholastic thing, what is higher, earth or water? This is in Latin, but it's very aqueous. So it is dubia, it's called dubia, the doubt. So he is not in front, contrary sense. So, uh, but anyway, the the whole um, the whole thing of the um, high water and uh, is very much, especially the flood, the universal flood, is very much related to eschatology, of the vision of the end of the world, apocalyptic visions that possible in the world, the world hasn't finished because God has chosen Noah to bring the people, but God has chosen Moses to bring out the people, but still there is a kind of movement towards towards the end of the world and another uh, quite important cultural metaphor related to this is the famous myth of the Atlantis, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as you all know as we all know uh, first cited by Plato in two of his dialogues mm -hmm. this imaginary kind of civilization that conquered with Athens, <coughs> uh, so there was a prototype of Utopia that later moved more and back and, and many people developed up to Blavatsky who said that her secret doctrine was dictated by the inhabitants of the Atlantis. Mm. And of course the whole idea of Venice in the, uh, whether we want that or not, it is very much related in our European heads, <laughs> with the description that Plato gives, I just said. The island in which the palace was situated had a diameter of five stadia, all this including the doors of the bridge, which was the sixth of the stadia, and the, the stone which was used in the work they carried from the under earth for central island. One kind was white, another black, and the second red. And at the same time, how about double dogs having roof form of native rocks? Some of their buildings were simple, but others they put together different story, varying to color to please eye and to be natural source of delight. They can be easily applied to the our European vision of Venice. So the idea of Venice sinking as an Atlantean as a civilization is very, very deeply rooted in our minds, no matter. British, uh, Italian, or Russian, that's the kind of Greek culture that we share. Uh, and uh, we won't stop uh, much on, the, uh, on that. Uh, interestingly enough, the, uh, and I'll point that, uh, that later, that um, this myth, the whole myth of Atlantis was very popular, was very popular in the 16th century of the Utopia. There's enormously popular in the beginning of the century, the uh, pre-Russian Russia. There's been a painting by Rerich, mm -hmm. the parish of the Atlantean, mm -hmm. and he would just say, wait, I think. And of course we can see direct references to get to kind of Italian related painting by Brulov, every child knows the last day of Pompeii, again, the apocalyptic vision, end of culture, end of the world, and even has some. Then there was 
Leon Bucks, the, f the famous mm -hmm. uh, artist and painter, uh, this uh, known by Western as a Cezanne Russe artist again, this, mm -hmm. this Atlantic painters. And surprisingly, there is very, very little else. Uh, also, Ivanov had a big, big talk about Atlantis and its sinking and its reference to painting. But surprisingly or unsurprisingly, there's uh -huh. very little elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So Russian, pre-revolutionary Russians are very much, uh, very much concerned with this kind of apocalyptic end of the world, end of the civilization, sinking. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, as for Phoenicians, the only kind of, but it's exactly, it's retro, kind of retro vision. The Tintor, again, Tintoretto, Sus Susanna and the elders, there have been a few versions of that, that's 1555, the most famous version of that painting, that's in Kunst Historische Museum in Vienna, now exhibited for the 500 years of Tintoretto, and the, a lot of poets and, uh, and we know, uh, and Brodsky and again Russians, and Wanderstam, Susanna starts of the Dojna in the Venetian poem, and uh -huh. Brodsky in his Venetian stanzas, he says, Biodra Novi Susanne, Dolby Sitai, Goli Haldim, Ramra, Biodra Novi Susanne, Sapraždaim Pri Pogruženiu, Strokotar Kina Kamer, Novak Starsov. So the new uh -huh. elderly are filming the Susanna sinking. So Susanna is the image of Venice, the young yeah, people. Susanna is, Susanna is the image of Venice. Why? For him, yeah, for him, the image of Venice, he's a married, beautiful woman that are some kind of abused, visually abused, as we say. Vulnerable. Vulnerable and visually abused. Broski turns it, twists it again uh, by, by the tourists, so it's struck it. The, the photo covers of the new elders. Mm. Uh, Tintoretto was quite important for uh, Mandersam as well, and Mandersam has this whole vision, again, not, not apocalyptic, but kind of decayed uh, vision of Venice and death, and the Nitsenske Zhidia Vrachny, Chyoga Vesper, Zirkul Yerka, and Vse Prakhodit, Istin, Timna, Chyovek Rajdai, Zemchik Umirai. And Susanna starts of Jedi Bajna. So Susanna is decent, she, is, she has to wait for the elders. Also, there are some of that elders are referred uh, to Dodgers. As we know, Dodgers couldn't be elected for a certain age of 70 years, so they were all old people. So again, the, the uh, elders that survey that look at the Susanna but also control her is the uh, image of Venice. Uh, uh, in Ma uh, Mandersen sites again the... Uh, oh, where is this? There's another, another painting, uh, but also, also there is... Igorat Beret Kazinov Sevich is Lobna Gulab Zelitsev Kavchek and there is a direct reference of the mosaic of San Marco, of the dove coming in the arch and proclaiming, yeah, there is land, excuse me, there is land somewhere, so it's kind of hope. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, no, no, no. So, so, yeah, mm -hmm. that's the same cycle, that's one of the cupolas that depicts the whole... Which, which one is that? Uh, which one, which dome is that? Uh, it is uh, it is if you go into the in the atrium, but it's been a recent restored. I think it's to the left. There is uh, more ancient domes in the not the big ones. Big ones are all gospels. Another interesting thing about San Marco, which does not have direct reference. So what we're talking is this kind of field cinematic uh, kind of stage, because the mosaics are made in such a way that the light during the day goes through the whole biblical history. So people could say, stay there for hours and contemplate like a, mm -hmm. a film, different mm -hmm. mosaics becoming, becoming gold ah. within the sunlight and it accentuates and puts into focus, as we would say now, uh, different mm, things of uh, different 
part of the of the of the gospel. Uh, now um, the the um, interesting and maybe the last thing I would think, talk about today is the uh, there's some tiepolo, but basically all other references to water in Venetian paintings are mostly to do with sea as power, as we know Venetian power is a power, the naval power, built their power, being naval force, so the whole ceremony of wedding of doge, doge with the sea, with the, and throwing the ring in the sea, and a lot of various things are related to the sea itself, not to the lagoon or the hard water. Surprisingly enough, there is no, absolutely no substantial or any kind of significant texts in Italian literature and Venetian literature, which only in Dalek literature, about the high water. Which is quite extraordinary. It's, it's a very pictorial phenomenon. You can make as you see a lot of cultural references, biblical references. Uh, there's also this the whole vanitas thing going on, the Mm, the mirror, the double, the city, basically nothing, very secondary work, uh, almost nothing. Well, in Russian you can see the, mm, the idea of sinking of Venice, Atlantia is very, very, very popular. In Brodsky mentioned, in Manisha mentioned, you can uh, find other, other references. That's a, um, so the thing is here, I think the clue is very, actually when I thought of it when they knew uh, some TV people rang me a month ago, Russian TV, uh, trying to interview me on the, the, about the high water, and say, oh, the Venice is flooded, and if you look at the news, the Venice is flooded, the Venice is sinking, there are some studies how the Venice is actually sinking, now it's not sinking because they don't take the earth from underground, so it's maybe zero, two millimeters a year, so basically nothing. Uh, but uh, still, the, and this is flooded. The idea, the word flood is omnipresent. Well, in English, in years slightly, it is flooded, they don't use the word flood. While the Russians use the flood, Venice is underwater, 75% of, and the kind of some ecstatic, tragic, perception of the whole beauty of Venice and the myth of Venice sinking definitely uh, and the uh, eschatological vision and apocalyptic vision of the end of the times and as we know, uh, you know the water has references to time and uh, from Genesis and Brodsky who says uh, water is time about Venice, time is water uh, well in fact the Italians they say, well, it's bad, they say, sorry, sorry, Katya, you got your house all wet and your things done. But it's something that pass and go, come and go, and it's a cyclic, because the idea of the tide and the idea of the flood belongs to two different perceptions of the world. The idea of the tide is a cyclic thing that would repeat, that implies, uh, implies continuity, repetition, uh, it may be bad, but it'll get better, it will be high, but it'll get lower. While uh, the, the our uh, English are halfway, they're quite ironic about the whole thing. They're very, they're trying to distract themselves as what I read, what I've seen from the emotions about this. So they basically, as Ruskin, who's very patient about Venice and very, made a whole book because he thought these churches would disappear soon. But still, he would just describe the facts and the events, detaching himself. And while Russian would throw the whole apocalyptic vision and the revolution and the whole catastrophic experience that all of us have, the backgrounds, no matter, it's also partially Russian and partially Jewish as well, as we can see, and we can relate it to the catastrophic and the whole and a lot of things. So, we tend, we see me, to see the end of the world where Italians see continuity. That's why it makes such big painting, big big poetry, big. While in Italy, there's a few bits and pieces simply, but it is not something that is 
um, presents in the core structure of the culture. And uh, maybe I won't. Uh, so this is the picture, <laughs> I would say. Um, there was a me myself, as I belong to that culture, there was a quotation by Brodsky, it was glued to my win window, and as you can see, the aquata coming ah, from behind ah. the window was my kitchen window. So. 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 Не слишком радостная, но вообще, если чувствовать сиротца, то лучше в тех местах, чем вид, волнует, нежели без вид. Катя, сан Микелли, was it affected by this flood? Yes, it was affected all... Any graves were... Yeah, well, they, not the grave, but they are, as we know, they are marbles. It was affected, it was not, not affected that badly. The ones that came, it was quite high. Was uh, if even came within the St. Mark Square, but uh, for instance in Buran and Kyuja, the uh, general level of water, the more you go north, the water level is higher. But it was not somehow dramatically uh, affect. Mm, no, there is no no big. No coffins floating. No, 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 no coffins. The rabbis don't float like that. Not just Brodsky, but also Diaghilev. No, no, Diaghilev is high. As you remember, Diaghilev is quite high. Strange. <laughs> so. Does the chill get flooded? Yes, it gets flooded very, very serious. It's higher. So does it get into the cathedral? It does. It does. What people are concerned the history is say that every time the water goes into the cathedral, it makes uh, the damage of 20 years of use of the girl just walking in normal. Um, well, I will show you the last thing. The question about damage, if it's uh, water inside your flat, for yes. example. Yes. Uh, is it insured somehow? No, of course, the only insurance you can't get is insurance. Is it insurance, insurance against, companies, yeah, because against, it's very... Yeah. But it gets, people have yeah, but it getting being a Russian Jewish person, I got quite inspired by the whole sense of a series of prints of the off-white of various various way they can you look through nature. It was a very uh, funny post of uh, uh, of you on Facebook that you tried to get money back from the insurance company and it was such a trouble that you stopped doing it. Yeah, it's it be, be doing yes, paint, it's, it's, painting. It's much better to it's do painting. Because it's not easy sometimes. Of course it is not. Yeah. Even in Britain. I lost two, like last time I lost two, this time I lost two fridges and the oven. It's not every day I have to get one fridge in my studio where I work, a small fridge, one fridge. I mean, in Italian, especially in Venetia, they are very relaxed. It's been a month, so we're still living without fridge. <laughs> this cover is quite livable, actually. And now I'll show you something. Maybe. Listen, that's something that's in Venice. It's not siren. Ah. That's what we wake up in the morning. Ah. Now listen carefully. Ah. It's asking why it's in. Hundred, hundred, hundred and ten, hundred and twenty. So it means the water, even those who don't have cell phones or they know from the musical how hard the. Was it a certain composer? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's a sonora. It's a called Architettura Sonora. It's a that's a group that. Uh, elaborate some alarms, special. There was a special composer who instead composed this big opera, Aqua Grande. Just mm -hmm. Google it, La Finici Aqua Grande. It was quite an impressive piece of musical work. But that's how. Well, again, 10 years ago when I first came out, the serene, the alarm was much more disturbing. I was waking up thinking the planes were the bombing Venice. And, and you had the immediate. Uh, instinct to get in the shelter, the bombs will. Uh, no, but actually, then they changed. Then they changed to more musical. So now everyone knows how high the water will be from. Dun, dun, dun. But you probably don't have shelters and, and cellars. Yeah. No, of course not. We don't have cellars. The whole, the whole Venetian cuisine, the whole uh, cooking mm -hmm. culture is also related to the fact that we can't have cellars. 
So there was a lot of marinated things and also because for people into the sea trips and naval, uh, naval history. Mm -hmm. So they're mostly marinated things that can stand. And I very much appreciate it now that I don't have the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about your appliances, but in Venice I saw the, the panels which come up at the door. You have a panel which, which comes I mean. up to protect yeah, you. Yeah, I have a, I have a panel. The thing is, if you if the street is lower than your mm. house, a panel is very good. I do have a panel. You close it, but it's certainly like when the level is higher. So it's, and it's, it's up for instance, there are corners of my sitting room where there are or any piazza of San Marco or any street. You say. Also, another curious fact that when you buy property in Venice, there is a special telephone verde, or how you call it, you know, the free number mm -hmm. that you will ring and ask <coughs> at what height of the mm -hmm. tide the water would come in this property. So uh -huh. nobody can cheat on you. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Um, I think it might interest people, particularly think, I think most people here are Russian. The sort of the London equivalent to the. Um, Aqua Alta. Mm. I remember when I first came to London in the mid 80s, the Thames Barrier hadn't been mm. built. And I noticed there were notices all over huge parts of London warning people about what to do in case of floods. The, the city was constantly on standby in case of floods. And in fact, it's within living memory. I think it's 1928, the last people to drown, mass drowning in London, believe it or not in Pimlico, mm -hmm. about 20 people drowned. And interestingly enough, outside London, about 30, 40 miles downstream, there were literally hundreds, I think 300 people died in flooding mm -hmm. uh, on the Thames Estuary in 1953. Mm -hmm. And just to extend it a little bit, a lot of people don't know this, it may come as a surprise. In the 17th century, there was a tsunami, literally a tsunami, not here, in the Bristol Channel, and apparently thousands of people died. It may well have been triggered. There's a lot of theories about this. I mean, tsunamis quite casually cross oceans as a matter of course. Yeah. It may have been triggered on somewhere on the uh, eastern Atlantic yeah. seaboard, yeah. perhaps. And yeah, it was a tsunami. They've just recently established it was a tsunami, and thousands drowned in England. Mm. 1953. No, 53, about 300 drowned on the Thames uh, Estuary. Canvey Island, it was Canvey Island. What about Thames? Is it related to rainfall? Or more time? Same thing. No, tides. Tides. tides cannot, it's a river. Well, it's in, no, 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 it's, tides, it's it the tide that goes it's back, the tide, right? yeah. with the wind. Yeah, with the tides. No, 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 it's the tide. Mean, it's the same moon, moon cycle. Yeah, moon cycle. We have salty water. We do. Uh, so if you yeah. taste water where I live, it's salty. Okay, but it's so close to the sea. Because we have both. The moon phase goes there's the tide. What is related to the high water, or is almost a Scirocco, the the salt, the well, warm wind. You can feel it's warm. Oh, it's gosh, African warm. Sure. Or Bora, which is a very cold wind that prevents <coughs> water from coming out naturally. It does not pull, push it in, but it's, uh, it's lower. The Bora high water is lower than the Shiroko high water, but still it is. Uh, Interesting. That uh, it's it's wonderful. Uh, it, I, we spoke with David about water today, and I said, uh, like in Moscow, I, I don't live with I, I I never lived with water in my childhood. So uh, me and stream was more stream of consciousness uh, and 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 poetry. And I first uh, thought about this phenomena. Uh, reading Pushkin, uh, reading Medny yeah, yeah. uh, uh where he describes this wonderful, ter terrifying flooding. It was my first uh, 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 actually meeting with a flooding was in poetry. But I was about ten years old when I first read about it, but I've never seen seen that. Uh, but it's exactly contributes more well, that Pushkin to this apocalyptic, eschatology kind of end of the vision, end of the life, uh -huh. which is not directly applicable to yeah. to the uh, uh -huh. whole uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. Mm -hmm. It's just a walk on the beauty, yeah. but 
А у вас бьют о чем? Да, Well, my boat suffered uh, a little bit, but mostly from the rain. The crop is not good. It was half, uh, half full of water, but we've taken water out of it, and it's alright. Mm -hmm. Is there any prediction of the uh, scientists about the future of things? Yes, uh, there, is, there is actually what I was talking about. I omitted this whole meteorological part because it was not directly, it was too technical. Yes, uh, they now calculated the probability of high water, how often the high water of 120 may happen, 130. This water, like we had it, happens basically one in a century or century and a half, more than 160. So it's not very much, unlike something, when something changes really dramatically, it's not very likely we'll see anything like that in our lifetime. Mm. As we, as for sinking at all, there was some uh, ground taken from under the buildings, which may Venice kind of sink, but with the whole image of sinking, town is not quite, uh, quite adequate description, because the town is not sinking, the water is getting high and then getting down, and there is actually some not high water, only high water, but it's low, aqua bassa, in the winter, sometimes the hands are almost dry. So you can see the whole building, the whole Venice being much more vertical, like as uh, Greco paintings, all very much vertical, because of, instead of two uh, steps, you see ten steps down. Uh, so the whole image of Venice changes in a kind of well, gothic way, because it's very vertical. Ah. Angelina, and you are from South Italy, right? So you, how is your connection to water? To water. There is the sea, so um, but uh, we we don't have any Navagni near. Uh, where about? Where are you from? I'm from Naples. I'm Naples. Mm -hmm. I have been to Venice many times. I like. I prefer to go to Venice in winter more than in summer. Yeah, because <laughs> not so much tourists. Good example. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No questions? No questions or comments or comments. Anything. We have quite high water fairly often, don't we? You know, we go take pictures of uh, Yeah, we you know we've got quite high defence walls. Mm. Yes. Yes, um, to um, bring the focus back from Venice to England to to Russia, stroke Ukraine. I, I had a, uh, an extraordinary um, Epiphany, I think the word is revelation, vision of the power of rising waters to transform the landscape. And this was uh, during my visits to uh, Ukraine, which started in the late 70s and 80s. And um, I became aware, of course, as everybody knows who's been there, that there is a, a landscape, a topography, which is almost unique there. Certainly there's nothing like that anywhere in, in Great Britain, that you have half the city built on an escarpment um, several hundred feet above a very wide river and of course across the river there is an endless plain which goes on forever and ever. And I, um, after going to Kiev for about 15 years, I came across an astonishing photo and it was a photo of something, a natural phenomenon which was very common for hundreds, well actually for thousands of years or since time immemorial, which was that every spring when the rivers flooded and the Dnieper became swollen with water, then the whole of the, um, the left bank, that's the um, east bank of the Dnieper, mm -hmm. became flooded, not very deep, maybe a few meters, but in effect, from the um, city, from the center of the city, in fact, it looked exactly like a sea. Mm -hmm. And this was, I've never seen anything like it. You know, I, 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 just, uh, I, I just gasped. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to trace these photographs. They're not available on the net. And it was actually in a book that I had called Bulgakov's Kiev, funnily enough, which had pictures of late 19th century Kiev, including this astonishing picture. So, of course, when they built the uh, Kievskoye Vodokhranilische 
all this automatically stopped, which is a great shame. And also, of course, they developed the other uh, bank of the Dnieper, so of course they didn't want any flooding naturally. So it stopped, but the memory of this seems to have disappeared. And I'd love to track down somewhere, somebody has a photo, it's not on the net, believe me, I've tried. And it was a, a phenomenon which everybody took for granted, but which was obviously breathtaking and spellbinding, yes. and people took it for granted. Yeah. I think it was Sophia Cathedral Bell Tower. I went there a couple of years ago, and from there, if you look across the Dnieper and uh, across the left bank, it did look to me like it was the sea. Well, yes, but it's all 100% dry land because, of course, no, I think the, the Dnieper doesn't go up. Sorry? I think also it was like something in the, in the atmosphere and something was just like that it's... Uh, something merged. magical. No, 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 no. Uh, it was just metaphor. the... Metaphor. I think it was just the nature of the... I guess it was just the time of the day yeah, and when, you sure. know, when, the, fo when the, the water merges with the forest, merges with the sky, but it was a feeling like... You just see a nothing but by sea till 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 the sort of the end of the horizon. Well, yeah, but I mean, there's something like a quarter of a million people now live in that area. But in the 19th century, nobody did, so they were perfectly happy for the whole plain to flood every year for a distance of dozens of kilometres. And it's something which I don't think happened anywhere else in the whole of Europe. Phenomenal. Yeah. And now the memory of it has been lost. Mm. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Ask uh -huh. him. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, if I will ask him someday. Uh, I, I would like to invite you to open this wonderful uh, bottles of partly Italian, partly, partly Italian, partly not Italian wine uh, and, and water and everything, because we are also celebrating. Uh, it's it's New Year, kind of beginning wow. beginning of celebration of New Year. It's first Advent today. I think Advents are better than uh, Christmas. Uh, 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 because Not very Jewish Advents, I must warn you, Larissa. Yeah, yeah, because uh, it's a предчувствие всегда лучше, чем само происшествие. Anticipation is better than realization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, fulfillment. Yeah, I, I think anticipation is better than a fulfillment, so mm. uh, anticipate. Well said. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's you. Uh, so uh, please celebrate with us and uh, have a look at, at Francia's picture.